Welcome, and thank you for joining the program today. I'll turn the call over to Tony Casina, Orthoclinical Diagnostics, our moderator today. Hi, my name is Tony Casina, moderator for the Ortho On Demand session. As a member of the transfusion medicine community for more than 40 years, mainly focused on immunohematology and providing compatible blood, the recent times has brought the opportunity for me to learn even more about challenges that are ongoing with the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. As the coronavirus continues to infect more patients, the use of convalescent plasma as a therapy to help patients battling the virus is growing in demand. The goal of today's program is to share recent guidance and best practices and learnings from thought leaders who we all know who have been helping to battle the virus and the impact the COVID-19 disease has had on patients. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our presenters. As the Executive Director of the Infectious Disease Research Center at Colorado State University, Dr. Goodrich has responsibility for oversight of the Biopharmaceutical Manufacturing and Academic Resource Center, the Regional Biocontainment Labs, and the Research Innovation Center. He will share an overview of the current research and innovative technology his research group is focusing on to help meet vaccine needs for COVID-19. Dr. Goodrich is also a professor at Colorado State and will share an overview of the immunology of the coronavirus and will highlight what we need to understand about the novel virus and disease in the context of treatment with convalescent plasma for patients with COVID-19. The next two speakers have led the implementation of convalescent programs and will share guidance and learnings to date. Dr. Savannah Wendell, the medical director of the Sierra Lebanese Hospital Blood, Blood Bank in Sao Paulo, Brazil, lends an international perspective as he notes differences as well as common challenges in adopting the use of, of uh, convalescent plasma in low to middle and high income countries. Dr. Wendell is a past president of ISBT and as a current member of two and as a current member of two ISBT working parties, is a contributing author of two guidance documents regarding COVID-19 convalescent plasma. Drawing on these papers, he will share key ethical, quality, and safety guidance for the selection of donors the collection and processing of blood, and the transfusion of CCP. Dr. Katz is renowned for his work in protecting the blood supply from infectious diseases, including HIV, and has received many humanitarian and achievement awards for his work in this field. He is the chair of the, of the AADB Transfusion Transmitted Diseases Committee and is an associate editor of the just released edition of the technical manual, the AWB's widely referenced flagship publication. As the current chief medical officer of the Mississippi Valley Regional Blood Center in Iowa, Dr. Katz describes the collaborative model created by the blood center, working with the largest hospital system in the region to identify and contact prospective donors to meet the need for COVID-19 convalescent plasma as the infection spreads. Ortho Clinical Diagnostic is very proud to sponsor this panel of experts. One last note before we get started. The presentations last about an hour and will be followed by a question and answer session. With that, we will begin the program. Dr. Goodrich, welcome and please begin. Thank you, Tony, and um, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, we thought that we would start off uh, basically with a description of some of the uh, immunology of the virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is the causative agent of COVID-19, and a, a little bit of the understanding of the disease as we know it today, because this is certainly something which is evolving uh, in both our understanding and um, uh, 
identification of issues that we don't fully understand today. So before we dive in, I did want to provide a little bit of a um, statement uh, regarding the conflict of interest. Uh, regarding some of the things that I'll be talking today, I'm an inventor of the Mirasol PRT product for treatment of blood products. I'm an inventor of the Solovax vaccine platform, which I'll talk a little bit about today in the second half of my presentation. I've also served as a consultant to groups like Terumo BCT and other organizations that are developing pathogen reduction methods for blood products. Um, I would state up front that my views do not necessarily reflect those of Colorado State or the U.S. Department of Defense, which has funded a good portion of the work that I have done in this space. Um, and uh, just make that clear, hopefully, from the beginning. Uh, just in terms of the agenda, as I mentioned, my talk will be broken up into two parts. Uh, the first is really to do a review of the immunology of the virus and, and provide an understanding of the disease as we know it today. And then I'll come back at the end to talk a little bit about what's next uh, and some of the vaccine development at the Infectious Disease Research Center at Colorado State University. We thought I would start off just by giving you a little bit of an overview very quickly of uh, what the Infectious Disease Research Center is. Uh, it is a facility located um, in Fort Collins, Colorado, in the foothills, as you can see here. Uh, and it's about 120,000 square feet of complexes with about 50,000 square feet of biosafety level three laboratories, which allow for high containment uh, research uh, programs. The facility is really divided up into three distinct units, as Tony mentioned. Uh, one of those, we're very proud to be a National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases uh, Center uh, for the regional biocontainment laboratories, which are located across the U.S. Uh, we have one of the largest footprints of those facilities, and really this was part of the vision of NIAID back in the uh, early to mid-2000s to create centers in the United States that would have the capability both in terms of infrastructure as well as training and uh, expertise in handling infectious diseases that required high containment biological uh, processes and handling conditions so that research and development efforts could be done on, on in addressing those particular threats as they emerge. Um, as part of that, we have the Research Innovation Center, which shares academic and uh, private industry laboratory space. The idea is to create a collaborative environment between the private sector and the public sector, uh, which allows interactions that help to advance uh, new therapeutics, diagnostics, uh, vaccines uh, for treating uh, human and animal diseases. And then Biomark, which is our biopharmaceutical manufacturing and academic resource center, which is a not-for-profit uh, contract development manufacturing organization that has the capability not only of doing research with BSL-3-based agents, uh, but also uh, is compliant with good manufacturing practices and procedures required to develop and produce those materials suitable for use in human clinical trials and, and development research. So that's a little bit about the organization. Um, in terms of coronavirus, uh, obviously many of you may know some of the background on this by now. Uh, it refers to Crown, Corona, uh, which describes the morphology of the virus with proteins that spike from the surface of the viruses. Uh, they're first discovered in 1965. Um, all of these uh, coronaviruses are animal origin. They're discovered in mammals and birds in the 1930s. Of course, COVID-19 is the name of the disease which is associated with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, virus, severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2. Um, it's the seventh human coronavirus that's been identified. And now, given some of the uh, epidemics that have uh, certainly the most recent one with COVID-19, but not the only one that has been associated with human disease transmission, there have been examples with SARS-1, so to speak, in South China in the November 2002 to July 2003 period, where 29 countries and three continents and over 8,000 cases uh, were, in, were uh, individuals who were infected by SARS-CoV uh, during that outbreak, and certainly MERS, which emerged in 2012 uh, and, and has continued to emerge in different locations around the world. By January 2020, over 2,500 cases with 866 deaths have been recorded according um, to literature that's available on that particular disease. So there have certainly been examples 
of these coronaviruses having uh, significant impacts in um, human populations over the last several years. One of the things that's important about these coronaviruses, and in particular with SARS-CoV-2, is how they infect cells. And you may have heard a lot about angiotensin converting enzyme 2, or ACE2, uh, which is in a protein which is present in many cell membranes, many different types of cells. That is actually the pathway by which the virus is able to enter cells. Uh, it attaches through the spike protein, the receptor binding domain, which interacts with the human ACE2 uh, protein and can enter into cells, infect those cells, and result in the complications that are associated with disease. And it's because of the diverse cellular populations that are present that possess this receptor uh, that you see many of the diverse types of symptoms that are observed in patients who are infected uh, with the virus. Uh, the, the, the protein is present in alveolar cells, lung alveolar cells. It's present in enterocytes of the small intestine. It's present in endothelial and arterial smooth muscle cells. Uh, it's also um, observed, at least the messenger RNA, is being expressed in cerebral cortex, uh, hypothalamus, thalamus, and the brainstem. And so you see a diverse uh, display of symptoms in individuals who are infected because of the types of cells that are being infected uh, by the presence of this receptor binding mechanism through which the uh, virus is able to enter. And that's an important feature, which I'll come back to in the second part of uh, the presentation. Um, it's even been reported most recently, this is a paper from a colleague, Steve Spitalnik at uh, Columbia University, talking about the impact, for example, that uh, uh, the virus has on um, uh, protein damage and membrane lipid remodeling occurring in red blood cells from COVID-19 patients. And there have been some interesting observations in the literature about the dependence on of disease severity in different blood types, and there have been questions about oxygen delivery capacity uh, in individuals who have been impacted. And this type of data, this is a, an early preprint of, of this study, um, is beginning to shed some light on perhaps why uh, those kinds of effects are being observed with the impact directly on uh, red blood cells as a result of infection with uh, COVID-19. Um, I think data on, in this area will continue to emerge as we continue to better understand the disease. What this has left us with, obviously, is a challenge in terms of how do we manage a pandemic when there's no vaccine. Uh, a new emerging agent on the scene uh, often emerges into human populations and spreads before uh, active therapeutics, effective therapeutics, or effective vaccine strategies exist. How do we deal with that? Well, one of the ways and one of the main topics of this discussion today is convalescent plasma. And convalescent plasma is not new. It's been around for many years. Uh, it's generally used when there's no other therapy available, or, and, and it, it's required that there have to be people who recover from the disease. So it was first used, uh, as, as discussed at least as early as 1918 during the influenza pandemic of, the, of that era. Um, the method's been used against a number of other novel viruses that spread through communities with no natural immunity uh, when there's no vaccine or no effective antiviral uh, therapy. The examples include things like diphtheria, 1918 flu pandemic, measles, SARS, MERS, and Ebola uh, most recently. Um, when I first put this slide together for another presentation back in May, there were 1,410 COVID-19 related clinical trials that were registered, clinicaltrials.gov, and 62 of them involved convalescent plasma. I went in this morning to update this, and uh, I found now there are over 2,792 clinical trials that involve uh, COVID-19, and 131 of those studies involving convalescent plasma. So just from May 12th to today, July 28th, uh, there's been a doubling of the amount of efforts that are going on with both research studies associated with the disease as well as with the use of convalescent plasma to treat them. And the idea is to utilize a product in which patients who have uh, been infected, who have the disease and have recovered from the disease, but generate antibodies, 
uh, in their plasma that have the capacity to bind to and neutralize the virus from entering cells and causing infection, uh, that you can use the plasma that, that is derived from those individuals to isolate immune globulins that can be effective in helping or protecting individuals who are in acute phases of disease. That's the concept, one of the concepts behind the use of convalescent plasma in the context of treating disease. It was first described here for SARS-CoV-2. This is one of the seminal papers that was published in PNAS um, during uh, the early phases of uh, the disease outbreak, the pandemic. Uh, this was by Duan and colleagues uh, in China describing their use of a product. Their methodology involved looking at neutralizing antibodies in a pseudovirus assay. Uh, all of the patients who received the plasma from donors with at least titers of 1 to 160. Uh, they measured IgG and IgM and correlated those with the neutralizing antibodies obtained in a plaque reduction neutralization test. And they looked at the donated units, uh, uh, test the donors with nasal swab uh, values, as well as treating all of the units with the PRT method to a short, because in the early days we weren't certain what is the viral load, is there viremia, is that live virus? Uh, they treated it with a process using methylene blue in, in order to assure that there was no live virus present in those products. Since that time, there have been a number of additional studies that we've begun to learn more. This is a more recent article that was published on um, in Nature. Uh, uh, on convergent antibody responses to SARS-CoV-2 in convalescent individuals. And there's some interesting data that's coming out of this work that I think also informs us relative to developing strategies for both therapeutics as well as vaccines. Um, in that study, it was reported that at least 39 days, an average of 39 days after onset of symptoms, there was a wide range of antibody titers, neutralizing antibody titers in a pseudovirus assay that were measured, ranging from um, 1 in 50 up to greater than 1 in 5,000. Um, interestingly, despite, in some cases, low levels of antibody titer that was observed, all of these products contained uh, levels of, of antibodies to three distinct epitopes on the receptor binding domain, that spike protein that I showed you in a previous slide, that had very, very high viral neutralizing capabilities. And so the authors of this paper conjectured that perhaps it's not the total amount of neutralizing antibody that's important as it is the low levels of these very potent antibodies specifically directed against receptor binding domain in the spike protein uh, that may confer some of the protective effects. And that, of course, can inform us about uh, strategies and approaches that we need to use not only for therapeutics, but also for the development of vaccines. And I'll come back to that in the second half of my presentation. We've been doing uh, testing of products uh, here at uh, Colorado State University. These are products that are collected as part of a convalescent uh, uh, plasma program, collection program, where we're actually using not a pseudovirus ass assay, but because we're in a BSL-3 environment, we can do this work uh, with the SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, virus itself and looking at levels of neutralizing antibody titer. The numbers here skew. This is an early look at the data, just a snapshot. A lot more has been collected. A lot more information will be coming available. The data skews a little bit more towards the higher antibody titers than were reported in the in the Rabiani et al. Uh, article, but generally they're in the same ballpark range where you see varying levels of antibody, and those could be dependent on the average age at which these uh, products were collected. Uh, if these individuals were pre-screened, um, the process was done a, a lot later in the development and use of convalescent plasma than some of the early work that was described in that initial article. So as we parse through this data and begin to present this data, it will be interesting to see what kind of patterns and trends emerge. Not all antibodies are good uh, and not all approaches are good. And that's why it's important to understand uh, what types of antibodies are being generated in these cases. And uh, the, uh, the concern that has existed, particularly with not only convalescent plasma use, but with vaccine strategies, has been a concern over what's called antibody-dependent enhancement. And these are cases, and this is described in this article by Diolis et al. Uh, that came out recently, a uh, very nice article which uh, reviews sort of the mechanisms by which antibody-dependent enhancement and subsequent immunopathology uh, 
that's associated with these diseases can occur. And these are situations where you can have antibody that bind to the virus, but they don't completely neutralize it. In fact, by virtue of binding to both activating and inhibitory receptors in cells, you can actually create a situation where you get enhancement of the viral replication processes in those cells. These types of complexes with the virus with non-neutralizing antibody bound to them can also be a source of complement activation, uh, which can lead to downstream effects in cytokine release and chemokine release that ultimately has uh, the impact of enhancing uh, disease pathology, which you could see primarily in the lung. And so it's important to understand these mechanisms and how to control these mechanisms for developing appropriate therapies, uh, particularly those associated with new vaccine approaches, but also impacting the use of convalescent plasma as well. Um, the ability to be able to understand these effects is important from the standpoint of having appropriate models to study it. And my colleagues, Dr. Richard Bone, Dr. Angela bosco Louth here at Colorado State University have developed an animal model, a Syrian golden hamster model, uh, which has been shown to have a lot of similarities to uh, subclinical infection with SARS-2 uh, and um, high levels of viremia, uh, involvement of uh, lung, as well as upper respiratory tract infection. So these, this provides an effective way to be able to follow the disease and be able to follow the effectiveness of therapeutics, uh, effectiveness of vaccine strategies, and it's being used in that context today. And I'll show you some of the data that's being generated with it, uh, again, late in, in a later um, part of the talk. And then finally, uh, also being able to follow this from the standpoint of understanding whether or not there is antibody-dependent enhancement, whether or not there is pathology by looking at the lungs of infected uh, animals in the study and the extent to which that occurs, seeing bronchiointerstitial pneumonia, acute and subacute stages during the course of disease. So this really gives us an effective way of being able to track the, the, uh, the potential for these therapeutic interventions. And that's something which we are actively doing. And again, I'll show you uh, some data in the next part of the presentation. Um, it's my great pleasure at this point uh, to uh, turn this over to uh, Dr. Silvana Wendell. Uh, who's going to talk to you about donor eligibility for convalescent plasma collections, what to consider across high and low to middle income countries. Silvano, it's a, it's a pleasure to introduce you here. Thank you very much, Ray. Uh, welcome to everybody. It is a pleasure to be invited for this seminar. Uh, we will discuss a little bit uh, the differences between high and low and middle income countries. I live in Brazil, uh, which is a heterogeneous place where we have both low, medium, and high income countries or uh, realities that is in the same country. And I am going to discuss basically what we have uh, produced uh, on ISBT in two major documents regarding uh, guidances for procurement of COVID convalescent plasma, which I'm going to call as CCP as for now. The agenda uh, refers to provide an urgent general frame of ethical and technical recommendations on, on the use of CCP. The key ethical quality and safety guidance for the selection of donors, the collection and processing of blood, and the transfusion of CCP. The governments, it is very important that they should be reminded that an adequate supply of quality and safe blood components for transfusion is essential to meet the primary health care needs of the population. And that should, shouldn't be neglected despite these uh, tremendous COVID uh, pandemics. And we would like to highlight some, some differences between high and middle and low income countries. There are some concerns. The, the first one is that many CCP donors are expected to be first time donors. After all, they were patients uh, until very uh, few weeks ago. And most of them are unfamiliar with the donation process. So they are not regular donors at all, most of them. <clears throat> 
In addition, in low and middle income countries, one must remember that there is a higher risk of TTI, so transfusion transmitted diseases, and donation associated adverse effects. In most of the countries, there are unmet needs for blood products. There's a restricted cap capability for insurance organized and controlled collection of, say, blood and plasma collection, which will be a, a good opportunity to compare with the data that Louis Katz is going to present pretty soon. And there's a fragmented blood system with limited oversight, infrastructure, equipment, and trained personnel. In addition to that, it is important to emphasize that uh, there are more than 16, 16 million people, actually 16.5 million people infected by COVID uh, uh, this day. And only three countries represent 50% of these cases. US is the first, Brazil the second, and India is the third. So 50% of all infected patients in all over the world are concentrated in only three countries. The basic principles is that safe blood collection and transfusion is a challenge in low and middle income countries. And the absence of a well-organized and naturally regulated blood collection system and limitations of critical resources and manpower is a problem. Nevertheless, the provision of COVID-19 CCP in those countries needs to, to comply with the same principles of product safety and ethics regarding collection and use as in high income, income countries, and every country must produce a guidance. As far as the collection facilities, the collection of CCP is no different from any other plasma components. There is no need for a dedicated policy or procedure specific to CCP. We usually use the same sites that collect the plasma, either from whole blood or a pheresis. Uh, it is preferable to have a centralized blood services, either national or regional, but hospitals with necessary expertise and infrastructure are also welcome. It is important to emphasize that all certified blood centers or hospitals must be licensed for collecting CCP and to conform to the appropriate state or national regulatory requirements, which might be specific to each country. We have to take care about the donor eligibility criteria and donor qualifications in general, and to specific requirements that pertain to CCP. Also, it is prudent to defer mobile collections at this moment, uh, mainly because we wouldn't like to put our staff uh, people under uh, uh, an additional risk. Social distance uh, has been uh, recommended for some places uh, in order to, to make sure that the, the, the staff from the blood centers are not infected. Uh, however, the concern, there is a concern that donor interview process and collection process uh, will definitely uh, have a social distance less or lower than 1.5 meters or 6 feet. Some countries mandates, uh, mandate the use of wearing masks in public, others only during the collection process. There is also a recommendation for personal protection equipment, or PPE. Initially, it wasn't recommended. WHO didn't recommend any mask in, in, in the early days. Uh, however, with the evidence of transmission of SARS-CoV-2 from asymptomatic individuals, this has become a, a mandate. Uh, some form of face covering for donors and blood center staff must be uh, 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 provided. And one problem, particularly in low median income countries, is that access to PPE is generally limited. I am a witness here in Brazil and probably in, in several countries that in the early stages of, of, the, of the pandemics, uh, there were no masks available. Everything was out. And those who were available was extraordinarily expensive. Uh, now the situation is much better, but uh, maybe this situation might uh, occur in other countries because the pandemic uh, has different stages all over the world. The collection, uh, we ideally prefer the aphiresis because it, it allows a large volume with safety. A single donor can provide three or four units about 600 to 800 ml of plasma. Uh, 
which is the major mode of collection in several countries. But there are some barriers, particularly in low medium income countries, like the high cost, the technical expertise, the availability of a furosis kit, and it might not even be available in some countries. Uh, this was one of the first collections we had at our hospital. The donor was a physician, a convalescent physician, a very strong guy. So he was a very good donor. He donated about uh, 35 days after he became uh, recovered. We can also collect plasma from a whole blood when a fetus is not affordable or available. There are some concerns from that. Uh, mainly because anemia is more prevalent in LMIC countries. Some CCP donors may not meet the, meet the minimum uh, hemoglobin threshold, and we shouldn't forget that those, those donors uh, were patients a few weeks ago. We have a longer deferral period as compared to plasma pheresis. And another question arises, which is, what is the use for the remaining components from the whole blood, the red cells and the platelets? Uh, those are the main characteristics of, uh, of plasma derived from whole blood or apheresis. Usually, the plasma from apheresis is, is split into 200 ml uh, units. We have to test all those units by TTI uh, infectious markers according to each country uh, to ABO. For perils females, we recommend uh, testing for HLA and age. Uh, human neutrophil, neutrophil antigens. Uh, some countries have additional exceptions like uh, hepatitis A, hepatitis E, or parvo B19. Uh, several countries still require a nasopharyngeal uh, swab RT-PCR. And uh, there is also a recommendation to test either uh, neutralizing antibodies, uh, even though the cutoff uh, limit is not, is not uh, completely defined as a global scale, but usually the neutralizing antibody titer should be higher than 80 or most commonly 160. And there are also uh, the possibility to use specific SARS-CoV-2 IgGs, uh, either in-house or uh, commercially available, which is now more common all over the world. Uh, the labeling uh, should, whenever possible, use the ISBT-128 code with specific COVID-19 uh, labels. And of course, some countries might have specific labels. And the storage or expiration, if frozen, is usually one year. But if it remains liquid, and, and that is, uh, should be uh, a possibility in LMIC countries, uh, you can leave the plasma uh, between 1 and 6 degrees Celsius for up to 40 days. Uh, here in Sao Paulo, together with the University uh, of Sao Paulo, the viro uh, virology lab, uh, we have performed a, a program using, like, like uh, Ray used, uh, neutralizing antibodies with the uh, virus, the SARS-CoV virus itself. So we use uh, a, a, a minimum theta of 120 as a negative uh, result. So we have here three samples, one with a negative sample, 120, uh, a sample of 160 theta, and one a very high uh, positive sample. And we use two, two principles. Uh, we have the bright field uh, visualization, and we also uh, stain uh, the test or the plaques with amido black, which give us a better uh, idea of the results. So we have tested uh, more than 270 donors, convalescent plasma donors, and the results are available from 250. And we had a remarkable normal distribution uh, from teachers uh, of these donors. And if we define it, that the uh, cutoff would be 180, 24.4% of the donors would not be accepted. And if we upgraded to 160, 36.4% uh, of the donors uh, are uh, actually not accepted. Uh, we started with 180, but then we moved it to 160 because we found out 
that donors in this level had a very fluctuation uh, level. So uh, we saw some donors that was that were 180, and in the next collection they went down. So we decided, and we haven't seen this with 160s. We decided after two or three weeks of experience in our program, leave 160 as the cutoff here in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Another important issue that we saw amongst our donors is that we always uh, perform the nasopharyngeal RT-PCR. So that is the second uh, RT. The first one was when there was a diagnosis. So every donor had to be a positive RT-PCR in order to, to be included in the program. But for those donors who became negative and therefore they were accepted as donors, some of the donors took up to 59 days to become negative after full recovery. Actually, 33% or 34% of the donors became negative after 28 days after full recovery. On the other hand, for those donors who were not accepted because they were uh, uh, positive all the time, even if we tested for a third time, 36.2% uh, of these donors remained PCR up to 48 days, PCR positive up to 48 days. Uh, we don't know if they are infectious, so uh, it's, it's different, but clearly uh, there's a long persistence of RT-PCR in those convalescent donors. Uh, and those donors are, were uh, in the moderate or very mild disease. They were not critical uh, cases. We also developed a in-house IgM, IgG, and IgA test because at that time when we started early March, early uh, late March, early April, we had no commercial, commercially available tests here in Brazil, <laughs> and we saw no difference in the level of uh, IgA, IgG, or IgM uh, between those who were. PCR negative or PCR positive, even though there, there were differences in, in the uh, ratio between the absorbance and, 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 this, and the set of level of each reaction. So IgG maintained it stable, and we saw some differences, uh, which I'm going to show, with IgA. There was also a very good correlation between IgM and IgA levels with neutralizing antibody titers. The best of this was IgG, which showed a very good correlation between uh, signal cutoff levels and neutralizing antibodies. Very stable. That was a very good uh, procedure for us, which would allow us to uh, recommend a kind of surrogate test for uh, neutralizing antibodies. Neutralizing antibodies, either using the virus itself or a pseudovirus, it's not easy, it's not available in many places, even in the US, it's not available in, in every place. Uh, so uh, develop a surrogate uh, test uh, would be, I think, a, a very nice uh, solution. And by using this uh, cutoff of uh, signal cutoff of five, this is a ratio that we have developed in our lab, and each one has to develop in your own lab. But we were able to detect approximately 82% of donors with neutralizing antibodies over uh, 160. We have found this is the same uh, picture in a, in a different way. We also found, uh, which is not shown here, uh, that serial collection of, of plasma uh, produced a uh, considerable decrease of neutralizing antibiotics over time. So we had to cancel approximately 10% of our collections because the neutralizing antibodies, which was above uh, 160, became below 160. <laughs> and we also found a decrease in IgA uh, levels. So probably IgA might have some connection with neutralizing antibody. This is something that the scientists must, must look in the future. 
So I also think it, that it is important to consider, even though uh, we're not sure if the CCP plasma uh, uh, could transmit uh, COVID-2. Personally, I think that if, it, if that happens, it should be a very, very, very rare occasion. But I think it is an important uh, uh, opportunity now that we reconsider the use of pathogen reduction uh, procedures, regardless of the method. And I'm not supporting any any method. I'm just thinking that countries should revisit uh, their policy on pathogen reduction, and perhaps this is a good opportunity to implement it. Uh, this is our group uh, pr processing the first uh, unit in our service. Uh, we 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 use a pathogen reduction in in our, uh, our blood bank. This was the first unit that was transfused to a patient following ISBT labeling, uh, pathogen reduction, and, and so on. And the other thing that we, that we uh, found out in, in our cohort, uh, this paper was submitted to transfusion, uh, is that there is a strong correlation between neutralizing antibody titers and weight of donors. Uh, uh, it, it is a negative uh, correlation between the uh, time of onset of illness and the neutralizing antibody cheaters. In other words, the longer you, you collect the donor, the lower w could be the neutralizing antibody cheaters, and also a, a positive correlation with IgG and also IgM. I was quite surprised about the weight. In other words, uh, uh, skinny donors, uh, even though they are safe, uh, they tend to produce lower neutralizing antibody titers than those heavy donors or overweighted donors. And this ha also happens in critical or clinical cases. Uh, obese patients uh, tend to, be, uh, to have a higher risk than uh, normal uh, weight patients. In conclusions, uh, I think that CCP is still an experimental therapy. There are safeguards to define it to collect CCP on large scale. It could be adapted to both uh, high and low middle, high and low and, and middle income countries if ethical and regulatory principles are followed, used whenever possible under controlled trials at the moment. Uh, not all convalescent patient is a suitable donor. And we must uh, guarantee protection of both donors and recipients uh, using procedures strictly uh, define it, and surrogate screening methods other than neutralizing antibodies should be developed. Uh, with that, I have the pleasure to transfer this talk to my good friend, Louis Katz. Thanks, uh, Silvano. So I'm going to talk about how we did it in our system. Not so much because I think we did it right, but um, because um, uh, by showing you how we developed our program uh, to recruit and produce convalescent plasma, the important questions that you have to ask operationally as you set up your own programs become pretty obvious. Uh, um, I'm being reimbursed for this webinar and have consulted for Trumo BCT by way of disclosures. Uh, I wanna describe our approach, which was cooperation with the hospital system, show you a little bit about our online presence and some issues that have arisen as we've proceeded through our development. So this is our region. Um, and if you're not familiar with the US where that label says Illinois is the Chicago metro region. So that shows you we're in the upper Midwest we're in four states. Uh, the north-south span is almost 400 miles. We serve 115 hospitals in the four-state area. We're a medium-sized blood center with about 200,000 whole blood collections, 18 fixed donor sites, collect about half on mobiles, half in centers. Mobile drives have nearly disappeared during the COVID pandemic as the mobile drive sponsors have been unwilling uh, to have gatherings. So we're really probably almost 80, 
in center collections now, and that includes our convalescent plasma. The hospitals we serve range from rural critical access hospitals that might have 25 beds up to major tertiary academic centers, uh, most particularly uh, in Iowa City, St. Louis, Springfield, Illinois, um, Champaign-Urbana. So a very diverse uh, and geographically dispersed um, set of customers that we're trying to provide uh, convalescent plasma for. Um, this is Willie Sutton. He was a bank robber. And when he finally got caught, they asked him, how come you rob banks, Willie? And he said, apocryphally, it's where they keep the money. Well, we went to where they keep the money, which is our hospital system. So rather than um, general publicity in the newspapers and radio and on the internet and whatnot, uh, in uh, early March, uh, we approached our largest hospital system. Metropolitan St. Louis, uh, Missouri, and said, help us set up a convalescent plasma program. Uh, while they were in the midst of the upswing of their first spike, and it was a very uh, fruitful uh, collaboration because that's where the patients were. Uh, and essentially, what we asked them uh, to do was to refer the patients that have been hospitalized in their system who had a positive PCR. They had a lot of cases, they had a lot of perceived needs, so they were very enthusiastic. We had uh, a lot of apheresis capacity in the greater St. Louis uh, area uh, and throughout our system. We realized that while St. Louis was seeing uh, a large outbreak at that time, we would have broad range broad needs in the future. Uh, so we asked them uh, to help us set up our program. And we have a manuscript uh, accepted at transfusion that essentially describes what I'm gonna uh, describe to you. We had concerns at the beginning, uh, some of which uh, persist, and, and I think that Silvano touched on them. Uh, it's important for all of us to understand that the effect of a effectiveness of convalescent plasma for treatment or prevention of COVID-19 is absolutely unknown at this point. There are anecdotal, not anecdotal, small observational uh, series, and they're getting somewhat larger, uh, but they're not randomized controlled trials. And so uh, if it's effective, we don't know. And we don't know the characteristics of optimal donors. Uh, if effective, appropriate in vitro surrogates for efficacy are unknown. We make a lot of assumptions about neutralization titers that is not established. And then we go uh, another step removed to the use of other antibody assays, non-neutralization assays, as Silvano pointed out, as surrogates for neutralization. A lot that we don't know, and I think it's very um, it's very obvious that uh, we're in an urgent situation doing the best we can with imperfect data, both about efficacy and how to, how to choose our donors. We knew that we needed to be prepared for antibody-dependent enhancement, as Ray has uh, pointed out. Uh, therefore, even though we recognize the urgency of, of having something to try and treat these patients, uh, we in the blood community in the U.S., and I think worldwide, and especially at FDA um, and Health and Human Services Department of the U.S. government, wanted some kind of minimal clinical trial infrastructure uh, to uh, allow us to get answers to some critical questions and to be sure that minimal elements of informed consent were uh, paid attention to. This was provided in the U.S. by the Food and Drug Administration's IND mechanism. And for the vast majority of collection facilities in the U.S., this is the expanded access IND that has been coordinated uh, by the Mayo Clinic uh, with um, input from the FDA, the Biodefense Advanced Research uh, 
and Development Authority at HHS and the blood centers and hospitals uh, who have the donors and the patients. Our considerations with the blood center level now, as opposed to the hospital, uh, were serious concerns about an adequate supply of apheresis kits over some period of time. Uh, it hasn't materialized. We've done just fine. But particularly in March and into April, as we uh, ramped up uh, to make convalescent plasma, we were uncertain that we would have a robust supply of apheresis kits. And we wanted to be sure that the donors we brought in and put on the machines were highly, highly likely uh, to be appropriate donors. And we wanted to simplify the process for the physicians and the donors. The physicians, because we're in the middle of a pandemic and they're very, very busy. And the donors, because they're recovering from what in many cases was a serious illness. So our optimized donor selection uh, process here to avoid waste and promote simplicity in the number of visits uh, was uh, uh, developed. These are the early decisions that we made in March and April um, in concert with our hospital partners. First of all, uh, we restricted uh, referrals to PCR positive donors. You had to have a positive PCR, and this was driven in part by our concerns about the specificity of serology. We didn't know how many false positives there would be in a population of self-referred donors who had a positive antibody assay or thought they had had uh, COVID but had no molecular diagnosis. At an operational level at the blood center, we don't have to interact with public health because if you're PCR positive, you've already been reported to public health. Uh, and that simplifies things at a time when we had substantial uh, staff limitations. Uh, there is emerging evidence of more robust antibody responses if patients are sicker at that time. So we asked the hospitals to send us the people that had been clinically ill with positive PCR. They could leverage the health system EMR uh, using um, clerical personnel with access to the EMR rather than asking the providers and the patients to make the initial contact. So what we asked them to do was contact the donors as they were discharged from the hospital, discharged from care, who had a PCR positive diagnosis, and get verbal consent to provide the blood center with their contact information. And that's the way we've run uh, ever since. Uh, PCR only positive donors, essentially well over 90% referred by uh, their providers or surrogates for their providers based on verbal consent to give us a phone number, essentially. Uh, fully recovered is, has been defined as fever and respiratory complaints gone, anosmia, dysgeusia, disorders of uh, taste and smell, and uh, modest fatigue and whatnot are not included in that. So to be defined as fully recovered uh, with fever and respir respiratory complaints resolved. We were initially, and still are, uh, permitted to draw donors at 14 days after full recovery. You've already uh, seen Silvano's data about the high prevalence of persistent RNA in upper airway specimens. And in our experience, it was, it was much like him, as high as 40%. At 28 days and beyond, FDA from the beginning, uh, I think, paying close attention to emerging evidence, has not required a negative PCR. So we uh, very quickly excluded donors from 14 to, through 27 days and have recruited donors only 28 days recovered. We're using dual antibody testing at the state health department uh, in Iowa. Uh, we're using a highly automated ELISA screen that is antibody to nucleoprotein and confirming with a spike EIA that has 
uh, correlation to neutralization titer. As a result of this dual antibody assay, we have virtually no false positives. So positive PCR, positive on an NP ELISA, and positive on a spike EIA. And over 95% of our donors um, are qualified from the standpoint of antibody levels. The upshot of that is we don't require an antibody test before the first donation visit. So the donors make a single visit after being qualified on the phone uh, uh, in order to make their first donation, sparing them a separate visit for an antibody test. So the hospital system um, uh, searches uh, their records after uh, registering uh, to participate in the national IND uh, protocol. Those who are interested in the protocol, it's on these, this link, um, which uh, will be available to you. Uh, targeted recruitment of PCR positives, uh, as uh, described using uh, mining of their information technology systems, and an allocation plan that is essentially um, first come, first serve for hospitals uh, um, who are in the IND. We have developed a website for automated referrals. When we get a referral, we call, educate, and schedule the donors. We collect them on Alex and Trima, getting a mean of 3.8 100 mil doses per procedure, attempt to reschedule the donors after the first pheresis, and then perform antibody testing on each donation uh, um, before labeling uh, as convalescent plasma. Our hospitals, our 115 hospitals, get units on a first come, first serve basis based on the assumption that they're participating in the IND and uh, all patients are equal. This is our first 130 donors. Uh, you can see a mean age of almost 50, uh, female dominance, ethnicity reflected the demographics in St. Louis. Um, we uh, got 47 uh, total donors to donate. 36 gave a single donation, 11 uh, repeat donations, and four were deferred either for uh, infectious disease testing uh, or the presence of HLA antibody. And that's what will be reported in our transfusion manuscript. Uh, we have a strong presence on the web that you can go to. The website is uh, shown here uh, with a variety of different kinds of information uh, to allow the donors and providers to understand what we're trying to do. And then we have an online referral form um, um, uh, that uh, um, is easily accessed. We have it at this point in English and Spanish uh, are considering a couple of other uh, languages. Um, when they get to the website, they get some uh, donor qualification information. Uh, the most important information for the providers is they have to have consent to provide us with the information. How they get that consent is up to them, but in practice, it's all verbal, and that infection has to have been documented with an molecular test. The uh, required information to refer a donor is shown here, very minimal, all done with drop-down lists, um, and uh, very simple. Once we get that referral, we are in contact with the donor within 48 hours to tell them about the process, about the qualifications to be a donor, and to schedule an appointment. These are our antibody levels. Uh, this is actually uh, 470-some donors through last week. Um, and we use the Abbott and Uramune assays, as I've uh, described. Um, and as I told you, well over 97% uh, are positive on both assays. The graph on the bottom, if you pay attention to the Euromune on the right, shows you the decline in antibodies over successive donations. So uh, by the time we get to the uh, fifth donation and beyond, although the numbers are pretty small, 
we're getting down to your immune ratios uh, around five. Mayo Clinic has correlated a Euroimmune IgG ratio of four with a neutralizing antibody titer of one to 200. So we're currently restricting donations um, to uh, Euroimmune ratios of four or above, and we'll soon stop accepting donations beyond either the fourth or the fifth. We haven't decided uh, which yet, uh, based on declining antibody titers uh, and the apparent need to keep people uh, close to their recovery. Uh, our donors respond enthusiastically. It looks safe in the short term. Convalescent plasma looks safe, both for the donors in our experience and 20,000 patients published in the Mayo Clinic proceedings uh, who have uh, received convalescent plasma. Data on efficacy are not yet available that I consider uh, to be reliable. And there's an important caveat. We're using this to treat moderately and mainly severely ill people. And the Dutch have shown us very clearly that these people already have antibodies. Um, it is highly likely that as we move forward in the short term, we're going to begin dedicating this product to less severely ill patients. Uh, the evidence for or against antibody and so associated enhancement of clinical severity is not yet mature, but is reassuring, I would say, from the Mayo Clinic EAP experience. Um, we have a marketing toolkit available at our website if you're interested. And again, that website is shown there. I'm going to try and turn this back over to my great pal, Raymond Goodrich. Thanks, Lou. I'm going to go through this next section very quickly, uh, save time for questions, but did want to talk a little bit about all of this information that we're learning about the disease and all of this information that we're learning about um, the immunology of the disease, how can that help us with regard to some of the vaccine development efforts that are ongoing? Um, and I'm going to speak specifically about uh, one particular vaccine that we're developing here at CSU, but I want to emphasize there are, of course, a, a variety of different approaches and methodologies that people have used for vaccine strategies. This slide just summarizes some of them that historically have been applied. Mm -hmm. Um, I saw some articles recently talking about over 200 vaccine candidates that are in development. There are at least four of those that are in development here at Colorado State University and several others that we are evaluating as part of the animal and preclinical testing uh, programs that we have here with the different models, one of which I described in the Syrian golden hamster. The method that I'm going to specifically talk about utilizes an inactivated vaccine approach, a whole viral, viral vaccine uh, that includes all of the proteins, all of the components that are present in the virus, but utilizes a slightly different method for preparing it. Most processes today that rely on inactivation uh, require things like beta propiolactone or ethylene amine or formalin, and those chemicals act by causing protein modifications, nucleic acid modifications, covalent cross-linking, um, uh, uh, essentially creation of covalent bonds or modifications of uh, agents that are present in the virus. And the idea is to kill it, but leave it as much intact as possible so that um, you can still have antigens there uh, that represent what the native virus looks like so that you can develop an immune response. We decided to utilize a slightly different technique, which is based on some technology I was one of the inventors of, as I mentioned previously, for treating blood products to prevent transfusion transmitted disease. And it utilizes a, a quality of the riboflavin or vitamin B2 that when exposed to UV light in specific wavelengths can do um, nucleic acid based chemistry that leads to modification of the nucleic acids, RNA and DNA in a way that prevents replication processes. And so what I essentially describe this as is kind of doing a scrambling of the yolk that's inside an egg without breaking the eggshell. We modify the nucleic acids, but we leave the protein components of the virus intact and allow that to serve as something that represents um, 
the virus from an immunogen standpoint to utilize for vaccination uh, approaches. And that's the technique that we've been pursuing uh, with, a, with a process known as Solavax. We've utilized this uh, uh, golden Syrian hamster model that I described earlier, developed by my colleagues, uh, Dr. Richard Bowen and Dr. Angela bosco Louth here at Colorado State University. Um, and we looked at a number of different approaches and formulations of vaccination, including samples without adjuvant, just the inactivated virus, as well as samples with adjuvant, different types of adjuvants uh, that promote in particular a Th1 immune response. The reason for that is because of prior reports and the concerns as we've been discussing about the potential for antibody-dependent enhancement. Those are primarily associated with Th2 immune responses that occur or are driven in um, individuals that have infection or have been vaccinated. And so we thought that by pushing the immune system towards a Th1 type, a cellular immune response, uh, we would be able to ameliorate some of those effects and hopefully get the benefits of the vaccination without some of the drawbacks that may be associated with ADE type responses. We also used a couple of different routes of administration, subcutaneous and intramuscular to see whether or not there was a difference or a preference in outcome with those approaches. And what we saw clearly was that the IM route of administration was more effective in generating neutralizing antibody. Now, these are PRNT90, which refers to a sufficient amount of antibody to neutralize 90% of the viral infectivity in the assay, as we, we saw it described, as Silvano described earlier. And we did a boost at uh, initial vaccination at day zero, boost at day 21, looked at neutralizing antibody titers. The samples with adjuvant and administered IM had very high levels of, um, of uh, antibody production. Uh, and in particular, one of those adjuvants, the CPG-1018, gave the highest levels of PRNT-90 uh, antibody levels, neutralizing antibody levels. Uh, but it varied across the different forms. There was some neutralizing antibody produced in the, in the non-adjuvanted formulation of this as well. Interestingly, when you look at the results from uh, the viral shedding that occurs uh, in both oral swabs taken post-challenge, so these animals were challenged at day 42 uh, of the study, uh, with 10 to the fifth or 100,000 PFU of the native SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus administered intranasally, um, you can see that the results, regardless of the neutralizing antibody titers that were measured previously, are all very similar. Um, and the samples, both adjuvanted and non-adjuvant, you should see a decline in the oral swab data, the levels of virus that are being, being uh, uh, produced uh, through that route. Also in the caudal lung or the cranial lung, particularly by the IM route of administration, very similar results, low levels of viremia being observed, indicating that despite the variations in the neutralizing antibody titers, um, that were observed, the results in terms of the viral shedding or susceptibility to infection were reduced across the board for all of these formulations. Um, I don't have the data to show you here because we're just generating it. We did look at antibody subclasses, including receptor binding domain and S1 and S2 proteins. And I could tell you that very similar to what was observed with the convalescing patients in the report by Rabiani et al., Although there are widely varying levels of neutralizing antibody present um, in those samples, all of them possess similar levels of antibodies against those specific antigens. Um, and just to, to give you an idea, I'm going to skip through these next slides because uh, you know we do want to have a period for questions. But we've monitored this as well, looking at cellular immune responses, which we believe are going to be important to avoid some of the complications associated with potential ADE and resulting immunopathologies. Not surprisingly, the adjuvants that promoted uh, the development of Th1 type immune responses showed that relative to the T cell and B cell responses that we were seeing, as well as with corresponding levels of agents like IL-6 and TNF-alpha. So very, very favorable with regard to the immune response signaling that we're seeing not only with humoral uh, immune responses, but also with cellular immune responses. Uh, and that shows up in terms of when you look at the lung, this is some data generated by a colleague here 
Dr. Brendan Podell, pathologist in our group, uh, looking at the lung air passageways and airspace in the alveolar uh, segments of this lung, uh, comparing those that did not receive vaccine with those that did receive vaccine, in this case, the, the inactivated virus with the CPG1018 uh, adjuvant, showing a much better preservation, close to normal values observed uh, with the animal, the animal group receiving the vaccine plus the CPG1018. So clearly indicative of a protective mechanism. Once you have a vaccine candidate like this that appears to be working, the challenge, of course, is being able to scale it. And that's often overlooked. And so being able to produce this in mass is the next step in the process. Can we produce, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions, tens of millions of these doses of uh, vaccine by utilizing this method? And that's where our knowledge of how to produce these products, but inserting a new inactivation technology, not based on chemical or radiation by itself or heat inactivation, but by the specific chemistry, that's where this may have benefit in terms of being able to produce high levels of vaccine doses in very short periods of time. And that work is actually ongoing now within our Biomark operation here at Colorado State University and being supported by BARDA, uh, which is the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority uh, as part of the response process and the development process that they have been funding to support the development of COVID-19 vaccines. And we're very grateful for that support uh, with the scale up and manufacturing process that we're developing for this type of vaccine platform. Uh, and we'll continue that development work hopefully through uh, additional animal studies, non-human primate studies, and eventually phase one human clinical testing. Um, and with that, I'm going to conclude this just saying thank you on behalf of the uh, group here, as well as then pass this back over to uh, Tony uh, to continue with the Q&A session. Okay. Um, thank you, all of, all of you, for your presentations. Uh, we are now going to move to the interactive Q&A portion of our presentation. Uh, the first question up um, actually is one related to the uh, ability to produce a convalescent plasma containing only neutralizing antibodies uh, by absorption and elution methods using three, the three specific RBD domain antigens. Um, I think this is directed to each of you. Um, the, I'll, I'll start with uh, Dr. Goodrich first, and then we can move on to the other presenters. Um, yeah, I, is, is anyone looking at this? Yes, I believe there are some groups, uh, there are a number of groups uh, that have been looking at a variety of different approaches. One approach, for example, is to vaccinate large animals, um, horses, for example, and to then utilize the antibodies that are, uh, that are developed against the um, virus in that setting, utilize the antibodies purified out uh, and, um, and have that as a therapeutic approach. I think certainly as we understand more and more about, again, which antibodies, which subclasses of antibodies may be um, uh, more critical, it allows us perhaps to target those processes towards being more selective and isolating, identifying and isolating uh, those from preparations. I also know that there are some approaches that people are using to produce hyperimmune globulin from human uh, donor products in large scale uh, production. Uh, as well. So uh, I think that is a potential approach that could be utilized, and I think part of that development will be driven uh, by uh, the greater understanding that we have of which classes of antibodies are important and, and may produce the most therapeutic benefit. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Wendell, do, do yeah. you, is well, there any uh, uh, work being done in Brazil on this or in other parts of the world that you're aware of? Not that I am aware, but I have two main doubts that I would like to discuss with you. The first one is that I'm still not convinced that CCP plasma is, is effective. So that's point number one. So we still need controlled trials to prove that it, that it works. 
Secondly, uh, I'm still not convinced that uh, if it works, it's only because of neutralizing antibodies. I think there are more things in this convalescent plasma than neutralizing antibodies. In other words, it's a, it's a mixture of different molecules that might be responsible for the therapeutic effects. But anyway, we need more time to confirm that assumption. Okay. Um, there's a question here about does the specificity of serological tests, qualitative versus quantitative, matter in the context of the evaluation of plasma donors and the future evaluation of vaccine efficacy? Um, I, I will direct this to Dr. Goodrich um, since he's working on a vaccine. I think it's definitely going to play a role, particularly during the early phases of evaluating whether or not you have an effective vaccination. I told the story to some colleagues recently about the fact I was one of the participants in the early hepatitis B trials, and one of the one of the things that was done during those early uh, trials was uh, measuring titer antibody titer uh, generated as a result of the vaccination protocol. Uh, to look at effectiveness. And I think that's going to be a part, it certainly will be a part of the work that we do uh, to look at effectiveness. And, uh, you know, my own personal opinion is that it's it's not just perhaps, as we're seeing uh, from some of this, the data that's emerging, it may not just be a total neutralizing antibody that's important, but a particular subsets of antibody that may be important in dictating uh, what is an effective immunization? What do you need to have an effective immunization? So I do see a role for those kinds of approaches in assessing efficacy of these procedures. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is a clinically oriented one. Uh, should uh, convalescent plasma be prescribed when patients' immune response is causing damage or responsible for symptoms? Dr. Wendell? Well, that, that has been described as part of ADE uh, response. Uh, we have, at, here in Sao Paulo, uh, um, transfused more than 100 patients, and so far the only reactions we, we have found uh, are um, allergic reactions. But that's a possibility, but in case, in case it is positive, uh, it, uh, the, the percentage is very, very low. And, and the Mayo Clinic report with over 20,000 patients also reported that it is a very safe procedure. Uh, we still don't know if it is effective, but at least it is safe. The next question is, what duration between each donation of plasma um, should be implemented uh, from an apheresis perspective? Well, in, in our experience, uh, first of all, we only accept donors at least 14 days after full recovery. And because of, of neutralizing antibody uh, test and the PCR, that takes at least a week to get the results. So usually we, we start to collect donors before, after 28 days of uh, full recovery. But with the, with the proviso that approximately 35% of those donors at the 28th day will still not be accepted because they have a positive uh, PCR at the moment, or they are they have uh, neutralizing antibodies below 160. But once they are accepted, we usually when we collect only by plasma pheresis, we we try to collect uh, once a week. Uh, but as I mentioned uh, earlier, we have found some donors that started in a good level and they decreased it. So they had to leave the program because the antibody level was was low. But usually a week, uh, that, that's the span between each collection for plasma theories. It could be a little bit earlier, uh, uh, shorter or longer. It depends on each, on each service. Let's move on to... Um, a question re related to um, transfusion of non-ABO compatible plasma. Um, Dr. Goodrich, um, are you aware of what's happening in, in your region related to uh, non-ABO compatible plasma and transfusion? <laughs> 
Um, I haven't been directly involved in the decision making and in the process associated with the Colorado convalescent uh, program in that regards, but I, I do know that um, there were some transfusions, at least in the early days, when you know the availability of the convalescent plasma uh, was limited and the number of patients were uh, significant. Uh, there was a desire to be able to use every donation that was available, and I, I believe that was being practiced. Uh, I think Silvana may have, you know, a lot more direct knowledge in that regard. Well, thank you, Ray. Well, actually, you would recommend ABO compatibility uh, for transfusion. That's, that's a requirement. It's not mandatory, of course. But in case there are no available ABO compatible, not, not the same ABO, but there, there must have ABO compatibility. In case this is not uh, available for any reason, uh, we would recommend that they use low titer uh, NTA or NTD. Uh, usually, uh, the definition of low titer uh, varies from place to place, but it ranges from 165 to 100. So, but that's a, as a last resource. The first resource is ABO compatible. Very good. Um, the next question that I have here relates to uh, the deferral period related to some of the um, viral uh, treatments that are being used, the antiviral treatments that are being used, like Ledemzivir um, and uh, Tuxelzumab. Um, did I pronounce that correctly? But are, is there any input that you can provide related to uh, deferral periods after the use of those products? I, I didn't get the answer, the, the question co correctly. Well, the, the, if a patient is treated uh, with redemzivir and they come to you to donate um, convalescent plasma, do you have a deferral period in which they are, cannot donate in, um, because of the fact that they received that antiviral? Well, that that's still under under study. Uh, we we haven't uh, had any donor at the moment. As of here, uh, I would recommend not to use those donor at this moment because it, it is in the unknown uh, region or, or area. It's a gray zone. So why why bother to collect from this particular donor? What we have uh, already been very rigid here in Brazil is to collect only donors who had mild or moderate disease, not, not critical disease. Uh, because after all, we know that after 28 days, they might not be completely recovered. They, they might be healthy, but not in a very good shape. So why, why put these donors into risk? Okay, thank you, Dr. Wendell. Uh, the next question um, relates to um, someone asking all the panelists, what's been the experience using serology tests and which kits have been evaluated? Um, I, I would direct this first to Dr. Goodrich and then Dr. Wendell and maybe Dr. Katz has solved his audio issues. Uh, I think we're going to do one more question here, and then we're going to be out of time. Um, my apologies. Uh, this question, I think, is one of, of interest uh, from a vaccine perspective. Do you see a role for an, an antibody test to be used as a companion diagnostic to a vaccine? Possibly test patients 10 plus days after vaccinating a, a patient to ensure the vaccine is working. I'll direct that first to Dr. Goodrich, uh, and then I'll ask the other two uh, presenters to uh, comment. I, I think certainly in the early days of vaccine development, that will be an important assay, an important readout. It, it won't be the only readout uh, that's utilized, but it will be an important one in order to evaluate the effectiveness of uh, different vaccines, measuring, again, I think not only direct neutralizing antibody titers, but potentially and measuring IgG, IgA, IgM, 
but also measuring uh, perhaps in the future different subsets of antibodies. Again, if we're able to correlate that with better protection that we see uh, both in vitro and in preclinical animal studies. Um, over time, is that going to be consistent that everyone will need to do a follow-up? Again, I look historically at uh, clearly in the early phases of clinical trial work, that's going to be important. Ultimately, what, hope, what we will hopefully find is that there is an, a, a certain effectiveness level that we can then say, if you're vaccinated, you're more like, you're, you're, you're very likely to have sufficient levels of neutralizing antibody that we don't have to measure it in every single case. I get a flu vaccine every year. I don't go in and measure my titers afterwards. Uh, to determine whether or not that vaccine was effective in generating the right response. And it's just that over time, we've accepted through the data that has been collected in clinical work that there is a correlation. So I think that'll be the same here. Uh, Dr. Katz, uh, do you have a yeah. question? Well, I agree with what Ray said. And also just want to, once again, the, the caveat is we're making all kinds of assumptions about the what what the correlates of immunity of a, effective immunity are neutralizing antibody um, what kind of cellular response whatnot uh, I think the answer to the question lies in understanding immunity rather than speculating about what test is going to tell us what yeah. at this point okay thank you dr. Wendell any commentary on your part no I agree with my previous uh, colleagues, I think that we are in the stage of knowing uh, every day something more about this unknown disease until very recently, and 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 certainly what we what we explain today might be changed the next week. And so we have to get an open mind and be alert because we are learning all all day, and, and certainly uh, there will be some changes in our. Immune, immune uh, let's say, knowledge about the past. Uh, it's, it's, it's remarkable how we knew until six months ago. It's completely different uh, today, and probably will be in the next six months. Anyway, certainly. Okay. Um, unfortunately, we've ran out of time for uh, answering questions. Uh, we're now going to close this uh, this session out. Uh, thank you to our speakers for sharing your expertise and your ongoing research with all of us and for answering the questions posed by today's audience. To all of our participants, thank you for taking the time to join us and for your question in today, questions in today's event. We will address unanswered questions via email. We recorded today's presentation and will provide all registrants a link to the recording next week. At Orthoclinical Diagnostics, our focus is on improving lives through diagnostics because we believe every test is a life. We look forward to partnering with you today and tomorrow. Stay healthy and safe, and we look forward to um, sharing future Ortho on Demand sessions with you. Thank you, and have a good day, evening, uh, morning. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye. All the best. Yes.